Hi, my name is Michael Fuhrer. I'm a physicist uh, here at uh, Monash University in the School of Physics and Astronomy. And I'm going to tell you about a discovery of a whole new class of materials uh, that can help us make better computers. So first, why would we care? Um, one reason, uh, everyone here probably has a device like this in their pocket. And we rely on these devices to do lots of things. So uh, they can listen to our voice and, and find information from all around the world and deliver it to us. They entertain us. They predict the weather. They predict the traffic. Uh, and we want them to do even more, right? So I, I'd like my phone to be able to translate languages in real time uh, or drive my car. And those things are coming. So we demand a lot of these devices, and it turns out that the computation that they're doing actually requires a, an awful lot of energy. So uh, that's in some sense hidden from us because most of the computations are actually not going on inside our phone or in, even in our desktop, uh, but often they're going on uh, in a server somewhere. So they're going on in the cloud. And those server farms uh, use incredible amounts of energy. So these days, uh, they use about 10% of the electricity in first world countries. And that's a number that's growing. It's doubling about every decade. Um, so that's, a, that's a, a, a problem, and it's a growing problem. We want more from our computers, but they're using, uh, they're using energy. Uh, at the same time, the devices that we're using, the, the transistors or the actual computer chips, that are doing the computing are made of silicon. Now, silicon has had this huge re revolution that's made the information technology revolution possible. The gains in silicon every year are what's powered this, this uh, revolution in technology. But that, those gains are coming to an end. We're reaching the point where we can't make silicon transistors any better. So that'll happen in the next few years. And at that point, we'll stop having gains in efficiency in silicon. And so this problem will become even worse. So we need new materials. We need to come up with a new way to make computers which are more efficient, and new materials is part of that, part of that solution. So the thing I'm going to tell you about today has to do with the Nobel Prize uh, that was given in physics last year in 2016 uh, to, uh, to Michael Kosterlitz, Duncan Haldane, and uh, uh, David Thaulis. And uh, so this, this prize was given uh, for theoretical discoveries of topological phase transitions and topological phases of matter. So that may be something that uh, you, you might not be, might not be in the, 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 on the tip of your tongue. Uh, I think this is something that, uh, that maybe uh, the general public isn't quite familiar with yet. So, so I'm going to try to explain a little bit about what this means, what topological phases of matter are, and why it's important. So, uh, this has to do with electronic properties of materials, and for uh, many, many years, or for uh, almost 100 years, physicists thought of electronic properties of materials as falling in two classes. So there are really two types of materials according to their electronic properties. And those, those types are metals and insulators. So metals are things that conduct electricity. They're uh, materials like copper or silver or aluminum. Uh, they are conductors. They also tend to be ductile, uh, so there are other properties associated with metals. Uh, and insulators are materials like quartz or silicon dioxide, which is the basic component of glass, uh, or diamond, or Teflon. Those are things that don't conduct electricity. They tend to be uh, also brittle materials. So uh, one, of the, one of the great triumphs in the 20th century of quantum mechanics was to understand why it is exactly that some materials are metals and some materials are insulators. Not totally obvious when you look at them. In fact, the, this problem is actually quite deep, and I'll give you an example of why, uh, or, or just how deep it is. Um, so the element tin, for example, uh, can actually form two different crystal structures. So the atoms in tin can be arranged in one of two different ways. And we call them white tin and gray tin. Turns out white tin is the one you're most familiar with. If you melt tin and then cast an object, uh, that, that form of tin is white tin. It's a metal, it's ductile. Um, and, but, but it's not the only uh, phase of tin. And in fact, if you take white tin and you cool it down to very low temperature, it'll spontaneously transform into gray tin, which is an insulator, and it's actually brittle. So this uh, um, actually can have uh, major consequences. So there's a story, it's possibly apocryphal, that uh, when uh, Napoleon's army marched into Russia, 
the the, uni- the buttons on the uniforms uh, of the of the jackets were made of tin, and in the very very cold Russian winter, that tin actually transformed from white tin to gray tin, became brittle and fell apart, and so the army was in tatters, and that possibly that's that's partially due to the fact that these buttons were made of tin and they they transformed. So we want to understand why it is that that the crystal structure actually determines. Uh, or helps determine whether something is a, is a metal or an insulator. So to understand that, we need to talk a little bit about what electrons are doing in the material. Um, so what I'm going to talk about um, is the energy of an electron and its momentum. So momentum is a vector. It has a direction, and, and so it can either be forward or backwards. It could be positive or negative. Uh, and the energy uh, that the electron gets is, all, is a scalar and it's always positive. So more momentum means more energy, whether it's forward or backwards. And so we have a relationship between energy and momentum that looks something like this curve. So, okay, so now uh, I need to tell you a little bit of quantum mechanics, just a little bit. Uh, the first thing that you need to know is that electrons are waves. Um, so the, the, the fact that particles behave like waves is a fundamental part of quantum mechanics. The second thing that you need to know is that uh, the wavelength of these, these electron waves uh, is, depends on their momentum. So the, the, the larger the momentum, the faster the electrons go, the shorter the wavelength gets. Uh, so so the, there's a wavelength of the electrons that depends on momentum. So why does that matter? Well. These electrons, we're talking about electrons that are inside a crystal, so they're inside a solid. And inside a crystal, uh, there's a periodic arrangement of atoms. So uh, there are actually special wavelengths. Uh, when the electron uh, wavelength is equal to that atomic spacing, then it's, uh, it's in step with the, the atoms in the crystal. And in that case, uh, there are actually two states the electron can be in. So the crests of the waves then can be right on top of the atoms, and the electrons like to be on top of the atoms, and so that lowers the energy, the electron's happy there. Um, or the crests of the waves can occur in, in the spaces in between the atoms, and that the electron's not as happy uh, being in between the atoms, and that sort of raises the energy a bit. And so because the electron's in a crystal, and this crystal has these evenly spaced atoms, it, it, things happen when that wavelength uh, or that momentum is such that the wavelength uh, is, is equal to that crystal spacing. So what this does is it opens up these little gaps in this, in this curve. Uh, and so now there are certain energies that are allowed for electrons in the crystal, and there are certain energies that are not allowed um, in these gaps. And so the picture that we develop is something like this. There are bands of allowed energies, and then there are gaps between those bands. And so this is the band theory of solids. And it helps explain a lot about the properties uh, of solids. So the last thing we need to know to understand how this band theory determines the properties of the solids is that uh, quantum mechanics tells us that for every, any given state of momentum and energy, there can only be one electron in that state. And so we've got a certain number of electrons to put into these bands. And what we do is we put them in at the lowest energy and then they kind of fill things up, up to some energy where we've got all the electrons. And when we do that, there's two possible results. So we can have, uh, when we've, once we've put all the electrons in, we can have a band that's half full, uh, and those are our metals, or we can have a band that's completely full, and those are the insulators. So that explains why there's two different kinds of materials. Um, and I can also try to give you a picture of why a half full band would be a metal and a full band would be an insulator. So, if I have this half full bottle of water, this, this represents uh, this half full band. Uh, it's fairly easy to slosh the, the fluid around, the water in this bottle. And what I'm doing then, if these are the electrons in the band, it, you can imagine that it's fairly easy to create a state where there are more electrons over here in a state of positive momentum than electrons over here in a state of negative momentum. And so that means that those electrons are moving forward and they're carrying a current. So it's easy to create different kinds of states carrying different amounts of current by sloshing the electrons around or the fluid around. So that's uh, the half full band, which would be a metal. Uh, In a full band, no amount of sloshing creates any state that carries current because I can't, uh, 
make the positive momentum states any more populated than the negative momentum states. And so there's really no way to get current to flow here. So there's an energy gap in the way, and you have to give the electrons that extra energy to get over the gap. And that's very difficult to do, and so the insulator doesn't, doesn't carry any current. It's interesting to think about this full band because what this full band is, is it's electrons in different states of different energy and different momentum. And so the electrons are actually moving around some of them are moving to the, to the right, some of them are moving to the left, but in net, there's no, there's no current flowing. And so even in an insulator, we think of as electrons as actually moving around in some sense, but, uh, but they're not carrying any net current. Okay. All right, so that's good. This is our picture of, of, of the electronic properties of metals and insulators. It explains everything. Um, so at least that's what we thought. Uh, until uh, oh, around 30 years ago or so, uh, physicists started looking at a very special system. So um, that special system uh, is a very, very thin metal. Uh, it's thin enough that the electrons are really confined to only move in two dimensions, so only move in a plane uh, in, a, in a magnetic field, okay? Um, well, that's what they were looking at. It turns out to be interesting. So what does the magnetic field do? So a magnetic field causes the electrons to bend in their trajectories. So an electron moving along will curve. If we have a really strong magnetic field, what that does is it makes the electrons tend to go around in little loops. So we picture the electrons are sitting in this, this plane of this material and they're making little loops. Um, but again, quantum mechanics tells us that these electrons must be waves. And so this picture of, of little uh, billiard balls going in loops isn't quite right. We need to convert those to waves. And so these waves are kind of curled up on each other uh, and they, they come back around to meet each other head to tail. There are different ways that waves can do that. Um, we can have different number of wavelengths going around that loop, but it should be an integer because they should come back and meet each other. Um, and so physicists thought about this particular system and they said, well, aha, this is gonna give us new energy bands, and that's, that's what it does. So there's a new energy band now associated with every integer number of wavelengths around that loop. Um, so in a really high magnetic field, what we expect is that we'll get an insulator, we'll get uh, a material that has these energy bands, it has gaps between them, and well, at least if we get it uh, full right up to the next uh, energy gap, it should be an insulator. Um, okay, so far so good. But, uh, well, you always have to do the experiment. And it turned out um, when, people measured the, when people actually measured the electrical properties of this very thin metal in a magnetic field, they found something rather different. Um, so when you measure the resistance of this very thin metal and you turn up the magnetic field, you get something like this. So the resistance starts out at some finite number and it maybe oscillates around a bit, but then eventually it starts dropping down to zero peri periodically. Um, now, if the material is becoming an insulator, you'd expect the resistance to go up to infinity. It becomes very resistive to electrical current. This is a material that's resistance is going not to infinity, but to zero. That means it's not an insulator, it's a conductor. And not only that, it's a perfect conductor. No resistance at all. So this is very surprising. Uh, but this is, uh, this is a discovery that's now famous. It's called the quantum Hall effect. And so uh, this, uh, this effect is now um, well known by physicists. And it was recognized in 1985 with a Nobel Prize for Klaus von Klitzing, who is the experimentalist who discovered uh, this effect. So what's happened recently is that, we've ha is that we've had now a mathematical description of exactly what it is that's going on uh, inside these, uh, these materials. So the thing that we forgot, the thing that we left out that, that, that uh, when we, we conceptualize this material is that we didn't think about what's happening on the edges. The electrons inside this material in a high magnetic field are going in these little loops, but there are some extra electrons that live near the edge. And when they try to make a loop, they hit the edge and then they keep bouncing around along the edge and they actually just go one way around the, around the edge of the material. And it's these, ele these electrons on the edge that they have additional energy and momentum states that are inside the gap. 
And so these lines inside the gap represent the electrons inside the, uh, along the edge. And that means we can never have the system filled up to where it's filled up right to a gap and then there are no states above because there are some extra states always in the gap. And those extra states turn out to be these states that go around the edge and they can conduct perfectly because they just go one way around the edge. They never turn around and go the other direction. So this is what we now know as a topological insulator. And the advance was to understand the structure mathematically of this, of the elect, what the electrons are doing in this material. And it has to do with topology and it's a bit complicated, but now it's understood. And so understanding that is what, uh, was what led to the Nobel Prize in 2016. And what, what's more is that it's led to the discovery that you don't actually need a magnetic field. In fact, there are lots of materials out there that are topological insulators, we just didn't know it. Um, and so, uh, for instance, bismuth, mercury, telluride, there, there are several materials actually that are not, they don't fall into this category of insulator or metal. They're in fact topological insulators. And if you make them very thin, they can have these conducting edges that can conduct perfectly. Um, so that's really amazing. These materials are always out there, we just didn't know it. Um, okay, so I told you I was gonna tell you about why this could help us make better computers. So what we're doing here at Monash, we have um, an ARC-funded uh, center of excellence in future low-energy electronics technologies. And what we're trying to do is to make new kinds of transistors, so the basic elements of computing, and instead of using silicon, which is an insulator, it's a semiconductor, it's an insulator with a small band gap, um, we're gonna use topological insulators. So what we wanna do, a transistor is something that uses a gate to control the current that flows from source to drain. Our envision is to take that gate, we're gonna use it to turn a material from a conventional insulator into a topological insulator. And so what that'll do then is now we'll have these edges that will conduct once it's a topological insulator, it'll have these conducting edges and those edges will conduct current perfectly from source to drain. Because that's a perfect conducting channel, uh, it won't have any resistance and we won't be wasting any heat to resistance uh, uh, as those electrons are doing the conducting. So this is a way to make a transistor that works with really low energy consumption and that should make uh, our computing devices uh, work better and better and farther into the future. So. Uh, thank you for listening, and I uh, hope you enjoyed that story.